Good morning. morning. Are y'all happy to be in the house of the Lord? Stand with us and let's sing, This Is The Day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. Good morning. morning. I'm glad to see each of you this morning. Hope your week has been fantastic. We do have a few announcements that we want to mention uh, as we begin. Uh, As you notice, there is a bake sale going on. uh, It's for the women on mission. There's a lot of sinfully, delightfully treats out there. And uh, so if you would just uh, take a peek, I'm sure you didn't miss it when you came in, but just take a peek and there might be something out there that you just can't live without. And uh, if you can't, just take it with you. Uh, They would be delighted for you to do that. And, uh, of course, uh, I guess the outcome of that would be between you and the Lord. Just kidding. uh, (laughs) Just uh, enjoy it to the best uh, of your ability, I can say say it that way. And also, the women on mission are having a T-shirt fundraiser. And there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer if you would like to to purchase a T-shirt. And uh, this money uh, will will be used for... um, uh, the shoe boxes as well as other things, so just uh, remember that. Also, uh, Super Bowl of Caring, donations for the Lincoln, uh, excuse me, Lauderdale Baptist Association Crisis Center uh, will be collected following the morning worship service during the entire month. So just keep that in mind and be prepared for that. And choir practice is today at 5. Ladies Bible study is at 6. Men's Bible study is at 6 also. And uh, if you are interested in a puppet ministry, uh, either participating in it or uh, in in any form as a volunteer, uh, there's a sign-up sheet outside. Uh, Just please sign up and let us know if you would be interested in that. And uh, we have two more announcements. I'm going to do one, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Peyton to share with you. We have a Joy Club kickoff mystery bus trip coming up on uh, the 24th of February. We'll leave the church at 10 a.m. and return around 4 p.m. I think it's about an hour drive there and an hour drive back, so you will have some time there. It will be lunch. Uh, The cost of the lunch is $5 or anything over that. The um, Joy Club will pick up the tab on that. Uh, It'll be an hour trip. There'll be a lot of fun, prizes. Uh, It says delicious southern lunch. And I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. And uh, uh, people watching, uh, interesting sights, and easy walking. So uh, I'm sure you can find something in there to gain from that. And yours truly, I will be the designated driver for the trip. And uh, so I'll make sure that all of you get back as safely as I possibly can transport you back. And uh, so don't miss that. And just uh, please be prepared for that. And looking forward uh, to that. It'll be a great time together. Peyton, would you now come? Hey, y'all. So it's not my Super Bowl Karen announcement this morning, but um, so I have talked to Brother Calvin, um, and I want us to start back doing children's church on Sunday mornings. And for us to be able to do that, I need volunteers. Um, So I've already worked out all the curriculum, the um, schedules, things like that. Um, And I've done it in a way that you'll only, if you volunteer to help, you'll only have to teach um, the children's church for one Sunday a month. And they'll be taken out after we do our song service um, to over here on this hallway, one of the nursery rooms. Um, And I already have two volunteers, myself is included in that. Um, So I need for a couple of more volunteers um, to help start this up. Um, And... It's so that we can grow our children's department, Um, because if we have families with children coming in here, 
Um, you know, it's nice to have somewhere for their children to go um, because not every kid can sit out here and, you know, be calm and collected in a, in a service. Um, and this is a way for them to, you know, hear the gospel on their level um, so that they're not being, stuff isn't being like spoken way over their head um, because they don't understand all of the stuff that um, Brother Calvin says. And so for us to share, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, you know, it's just they, sometimes they don't understand it. So um, it's a great way to share the gospel with children. Um, and so I need volunteers. Um, and I'm just going to let you know, it's a lot easier to volunteer than for me to have to go down my list of names I've already written down to ask for volunteers, to ask you to help. So I feel like it would be easier to volunteer than to say no to me. So um, I know that we're all busy, but it's for the Lord. Um, and anything for the Lord can bring you great blessings. Um, and that's the most important thing. And it's with kids, and they're fun. Um, and it's only for a couple of minutes, so it'll be great. So um, if you're interested in that or you feel the Lord calling you that, we're going to start it up the first Sunday in March. Um, so that gives you a few weeks, and the first two Sundays are covered. Um, so if I need to, I'm going to start asking. So just let me know if you would be interested in helping with that. Thank you. She's good. Thank you, Peyton. Let me give a, a little wrap-up in a nutshell. Peyton said if you don't volunteer, she's coming to get you. And uh, so you need to keep that in mind. She's on her way, so it would be easier if you meet her. And uh, it would shorten up the, the journey a little bit. And the second thing is, she said, I really need to be praying over my preaching. And so <laughs> we're going to have prayer now, <laughs> and we're going to pray. And thank you so much, Peyton. I appreciate that. And uh, let's pray, and then we will move on in our service. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today. Thank you for being able to come into your house and, and enjoy each other's presence and enjoy fellowship, enjoy laughter, uh, and most of all, enjoy the time of worship. And today we worship you, Father. We worship you for being the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And no matter what's going on in the world around us, as discouraged as we may get, as, as frightening as things may appear, we know that you are still in control. And we see gloom, but you are our hope, and we have to keep our eyes on you. Father, empower us and enable us to do what we need to do for you. And we know that that starts by surrendering our hearts in worship. And today, we surrender to you, Lord, accept our worship, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, as a note, um, the bake sale items on the table, they are for the Christmas box, mostly for the shipping. So there are tags on each one, but if you want to give more than the amounts on there, that's fine. Uh, any amount you want to give, you can give. And, uh, but that's what that's going to be used for. Let's stand and continue singing, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on.
singing so good this morning. I want to thank Miss Susan for playing piano this morning, y'all. Thank her if you see her after church. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. First four verses will be with the instrument. The fifth verse, don't stop singing because we're going to do it a cappella. Thank you.
am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the And if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth. Uh, that's right behind the book of Judges. So if you turn left in your Bible, open the middle ways and turn left. And if you go all the way to Genesis, take a right and go back. And then when you get to the book of Judges, put on the brakes and flip slowly because Ruth will be sandwiched right in there, right at the end of that between uh, Judges and 1 Samuel. And so uh, today I'm just going to share one verse with you, but I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I'm going to refer to several different aspects of the, of the book because it is a narrative and it talks about a story. And so I want to ter- tell you that story today, and hopefully uh, maybe you'll gain some insights in your life as I have in mine. Uh, the title of today's message is Living on the Leftovers. Now, I don't know about you, but leftovers in my house has often been a delicacy not necessarily a necessity. And uh, in this case, with them, leftovers was a necessity and not, well, maybe a delicacy too. 
but it was first a necessity. In my home, leftovers, I don't mind eating leftovers. I, I, matter of fact, most of us, when we go to a restaurant, it can be a fourth of a roll left, and we're like, can I have a to-go box? I'll eat that later. And we'll take that fourth of a roll, we'll cherish it, that little bitty piece of bread, we're going to take it home, and we're going to keep it, and no one dare touch that. We used to have some hard fights in our home because of leftovers. My, my daughter would bring, she would never eat all of anything that she ordered, and she would bring it home and she would eat it later. Well, oftentimes what would happen, she'd go back to get her leftovers, and the first thing you would hear, who ate my leftovers? Well, we knew who ate her leftovers. It was our son. And uh, he, if it was in there for him, it was fair game. It didn't matter whose it was. If it was in there, it was fair game. Then he would invite his buddies, and they would come over. It was fair game to them, too. If they saw it in there, they ate it, which we were fine with that. But it could cause some, some serious problems in our household between our daughter and our son from time to time. But in this particular situation, again, the leftovers are not a delicacy. They're a necessity. And I want you to keep in mind that God will allow us sometimes to go to certain places so that we can be prepared for something greater down the road. We have defining moments in our lives where we've made decisions, where things have happened, and those things create a, a scenario or a situation that we couldn't possibly understand. We make a decision on something, and we don't know if we're making the right decision or not, but we make the decision, and we later find out that God has done a work through that one decision. And I find that to be amazing because I'm a person that likes to know the details. I like to figure it out. I like to see the outcome of it, but I can't always do that, and I, I don't get to experience that. Well, in this passage, I'm going to share verse 11, and I'm going to do some referencing. And it says this in verse 11 of chapter 2, And Boaz answered and said to her, talking to Ruth, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to break the bread of life today. And Father, I pray that perhaps we will glean a leftover. Something will be there today that we will be able to draw from and apply it to our lives and see that you are at work, that your hand is inevitably doing something dynamic in our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I focus on this verse is because this particular verse talks about when Boaz and Ruth actually came together. And I want you to notice that the report was that he heard all the good things that she did for her mother-in-law. And, uh, you know, I'm amazed, and I shouldn't be, but I'm always amazed by God's provisions. And once again, I want to say, I shouldn't be. The reason I'm amazed by his provisions is because oftentimes I look at the situation and I have this attitude, there's no way possible this can happen. And when I come up with that attitude and God does something in spite of my own uh, shortcoming, my own condemnation of the situation, then I am often shocked. What I've done is I've actually sold God short, and uh, it's because we don't have the answer to the, to the situation or solution to the problem, but yet God comes through for us. And the most interesting part is that when God provides, it's not just a spur of the moment, and what happens now has a greater plan for the future. It's not just for the moment. God doesn't just randomly say, oh, let's do that to Calvin today. That's not how it works. He has a plan drawn out, and every part of that plan that we participate in leads us to a greater portion of that plan, and we see it unfold. It's an amazing thing to experience that. Tough situations are often divine preparations for something greater in your life. Let me say that one more time. I want you to hear this. Tough situations are often divine preparations for something greater in your life. I want you to know that. That's important, and it's very, very important that we, that we let that resonate in our lives and in our souls. It's so important that we should think about what God is doing. God is is making plans not for today only, but for tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And we just have to sometimes hang on for the ride and see what's next, even when we can't see a possible way. God's plans are always the best plan. 
and they're the plan that brings the best out in us. And such is the case with Naomi and her daughter-in-law, or daughter-in-laws, I'll say it that way. If you go back, and I'm just going to refer, if you go back to chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, I believe, and I'll make sure on that, yes, 1 through 5, you'll see that Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, left Judah because of famine. And they went to Moab. They went to Moab because that was the place that they were able to relocate to and support their family. Well, while they were there, they had two sons, which is mentioned in, uh, uh, in verse 2, uh, Milan and Cilion. And uh, those two sons married Moabite women. Uh, they married, one married Oprah, uh, and excuse me, oh, yeah, Orpah, I'll get that. I want to say Oprah, Oprah for some reason or other, but it's Orpah. And the other one married Ruth. And in the process of that, Elimelech died. And uh, it left Naomi with her daughters and daughter-in-laws and sons. Well, if you read a little bit further, you'll discover that both sons died. And it created quite a situation for them. Because here we have Naomi after the sons died, you have Naomi and two daughter-in-laws, and Naomi had no way of caring for them because things were different back then than they are now. Uh, women typically did not hold jobs outside of the home. And by the way, if you are a housewife, I want to say this to you. God bless you because you do a hard job and you don't get paid for it. I want you to know that. Uh, and we recognize that you're not compensated monetarily, I'll say it that way, but you are blessed in other ways, and what you do does not go unrecognized. But what happened was Naomi was going to return to Bethlehem. She was going to go back to her hometown. And so she went to uh, her daughter-in-laws and she told them, she said, I can't take care of you from this point on. And if you read a little bit further in chapter 1, if you go down, you'll see in verse 6 and following that, that she talks to them and tells them that, that uh, I can't have any more children. You would not be able to wait for me to have sons, and I'm, I'm older. And the reason for that is it was customary in that day that if a woman had married a man of the oldest son and he died, then the next son would marry her if she did not have children or descendants from that son. And the next child would marry her, the next son, and they would have children together to carry on that line. And so that would also provide for her as well. And so what Naomi is telling them is, I have no way of giving you any means of having a child. I can't take care of you. There's nothing I can do for you. And so what happened was one of them went her way after a struggle. She went her way. And then Ruth said to Naomi, I'm not leaving. She said, basically, if you die, I die. If you live, I live. Wherever you go, I'm going with you. Now, notice, they had nothing. When they left Judah, they sold their land. They sold everything they had. And you'll see in a moment that Boaz would later redeem that land and also marry Ruth. But they, they left everything. And so Naomi is going to go back to to, to Bethlehem. And as she's going back, now she has another person to take care of, and she knows that she's not going to be able to take care of her. And so they get back, and it says that the people were glad to see her. It said the whole city was glad and excited to see Naomi in, in verse one, uh, chapter 1 and verse 20. And they referred to her as Naomi, and she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. And the reason for that was the name Naomi meant pleasant, but Mara meant bitter. And so I could see why she would be using the term bitter in her reference because of all that she's gone through. They sold their property. They moved to a new town. She, had, uh, she became a widow while she was there. She lost her two sons. One daughter-in-law went back to Moab, and the other one's tagging along with her. She don't know what life is going to turn out to be. But she has resolved the issue that whatever it is, she and Ruth are going to do this thing together, and they're going to get through it. She knew somehow or another that they would make it through, I suppose. And so consider this. When you leave home for a period of time and return, you'll find that things are different than when you left. As for myself, leaving home, I left uh, about 25 years ago. I left home. 
And uh, I still refer to it as home because it's basically my birthplace where my, my parents are buried. And, and so I refer to it as home in that regard. But let me tell you, home is meridian for me. Home is where the heart is, but that is my birthplace. And so when I go back, there's a lot of new people that have moved in, and a lot of the old ones have moved out and moved on, and some have gone to be with the Lord. And, and I don't know a lot of people anymore. I know a lot of a certain generation of people. And so when you leave and you return, you find that things are different, not just slightly, but sometimes vastly different when you get back. And so I'm sure that there were some differences there. And one thing that's noticed is that when they returned to Bethlehem, the reason that they chose to go back was because the famine had lift, been lifted and God had blessed them and they knew that there would be enough food for them to get there. It also tells us that they went during the barley harvest. And so all of this happened and they went at the beginning of the barley harvest. They trans, uh, uh, made a, the, the, the transition from, from Moab all the way over to Bethlehem during the barley harvest. So when they get there, what is taking place is they're reaping the fields. Now, Boaz, who is one of the um, uh, family members of Naomi, she, uh, he rather, had a portion of a field. They had fields together, and they each owned portions of it. And so Ruth talked to Naomi when the, the people would go out and glean, they would gather up the barley and what was left, they would leave enough and allow what was left to be gleaned by other people, typically uh, widow people. And uh, people, women who did not have husbands, they would typically allow them to come and glean. And so uh, Ruth talks to Naomi and says, let me go glean. And uh, she agreed to do that. And so Ruth went to this field and she began to glean. She went in, she did her thing, she worked. It said that she only took a short break and she went back to working. And uh, the Boaz took notice of her. She was not a normal person that was out there during the barley harvest. And so Boaz took notice of this. And Boaz inquired of her, basically the supervisors, the people that were reapers that were out there, he inquired of them who she was, and they told him. And so to roll it all up a little bit, he went to her and told Ruth to go ahead and glean. It's fine. I told the other women, as a matter of fact, that's in chapter 2 and verse 9, that you are going to eat with them. You're going to uh, take from the bread. You're going to dip it in the vinegar. You're going to eat with them, and they're not going to touch you. So when that time came in verse 9 of chapter 2, what happened was she ate, but she kept enough back to carry home to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, I want to tell you, that's called living on the leftovers. I want you to notice that. She didn't go eat a leftover, eat leftovers out of, out of uh, um, a privilege. She ate it out of necessity, and she spared enough of what she had to take back to her mother-in-law so that she could eat as well, and they were both just glad to get it. They were just glad to get it. And then Boaz goes to the reapers. And he said, I want you to leave some extra in the field for her. Now, I want you to hear me on this. You see what is taking place here. Naomi was at home. She was probably chewing her fingernails, wondering how this thing was turning out. She was probably worried sick. Ruth is out there willing to do whatever is necessary. She's not living on the delicacy of leftovers. She's gleaning the leftovers that someone else left so that she and her mother-in-law could eat. And by the way, it wasn't prepared food. She had to take it to the threshing floor. She had to winnow the barley. She had to go through the process before they could make it into bread and flour and dough. They had to do that. And so Boaz says, leave her a little extra. And Ruth went back and she told Naomi all that had happened. And Naomi told her, she said, okay, I'm going to tell you what to do. You listen to me. This is not a normal situation. It tells us in the scriptures here that Boaz was a close relative of theirs. And Ruth is saying, all of these things happened. Naomi said, wait a minute, this is not normal. You listen to me, Ruth. You do what I say, 
You do what I say, and this thing may change course. It may be something completely different. Let me tell you something. When Ruth made the decision to follow Naomi out of Moab, God already knew that she was going to meet Boaz. This was a divine appointment. But it all came through through a decisive moment in her life when she made a decision that she would not return back to her hometown, that she would move on with her mother-in-law because she was now considering herself one of these people, if that makes any sense. I'm no longer of those people. I'm of these people. I'm connected to this group, and even though I have relatives in this group, this is where I belong. And so, because Boab was a close relative, now hear me on this. This goes back to what I said earlier about the marriage thing. Boaz was able to marry her and have children. And by the way, just so you know, Jesus came through that line. I can't tell you how many greats, but they would be great, 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 great grandparents of Jesus. And so they're in that line. And what I'm telling you is that what looked like a hopeless situation was a plan that God implemented to get somebody where they needed to be. God uses bad things in our lives to bring good things if we just simply trust Him. And so I've looked back on my life, and, and uh, I've done this multiple times, and, and from time to time something new will even come up, or maybe a new uh, time, maybe not so distant in the past, maybe it's pretty, pretty close in the future. Or the, or the present, or the immediate past, rather, I'll say it that way. And I look back at defining moments. And there've, there's been decisions that I made that I was so uncertain about. I didn't really know if I was doing the right thing or not, but I knew that I had to make a decision one way or another. I couldn't just stay where I was. I couldn't do this. I had to make a decision. I either had to turn left or right. You, you're at a crossroad. And, and to make a decision not to do anything is a decision. It is a decision to keep yourself out of what God is doing or what you think he's doing. And sometimes I've made decisions and not really realizing the impact of them that they would have later in my life. And I've looked back and a lot of decisions that I, I made and I, I've just said, Lord, I'm so thankful that I made this decision. Maybe we even look back and say, what would life be like if I had decided this? Well, let me tell you something. I want you to hear me. Quit trying to figure out what life would be like if you'd made another decision. Live the life you have with the decisions you've already made. You will be a lot happier and a lot more content with life instead of trying to figure out what if. Because let me tell you something. If you could change yesterday, yesteryear, then we would all make some changes. But I also want you to know this, that if we went back and changed something, it would also change the now the present, and the future. And it would alter where we are in the process of God's plan, and we don't want to do that. So we have defining moments that we're unaware of that shape our future. For Ruth, the defining moment was when she said, I'm going with you. I am your people now. That was a defining moment. We all have them, maybe a business decision, maybe a decision in marriage, a financial decision, or a move to a new geographical location, or, or, or a college, or trade school, and the list is endless. But there's all sorts of defining moments in our lives that we look back on and we're glad we made. Now let me share with you two points today. A defining moment requires a decision. Now, I want you to hear me on this. So many times people will say, I'll decide that later. No, you just made a decision. You've made a decision that you're not going to do this, and, and so a defining moment requires a decision. Let me tell you, a defining moment, it can be bad also. Now, I hate to say that. I hate to bring up that part of it. And again, we can't go back and change anything, but 
Sometimes we've said, I wish I'd have done this instead of that. Defining moments could be bad, but I prefer to look at them as positive because that's the way that God works through defining moments. The defining moment, again, for Ruth was when she chose not to leave Naomi. Now, I want you to notice this. She had no idea that she would meet or marry a man named Boaz. She had no idea how any of that would take place, that any of that would take place. She had no idea how they were going to provide for themselves. Because I want to tell you, not trying to be critical, but women's lib did not exist in that day. They did not have college educations. They were not teachers outside of the home. They didn't hold jobs. There were no factories. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't mechanics. They didn't build chariots. They didn't own a bake store down the road. They didn't do all of those things. They simply relied on someone else to provide for them. And Boaz, being a close descendant, would also bring about the line that Jesus would come from. Now I want you to consider this. God chose a woman, a Moabite, to be the great, 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 how many ever it is, grandparent of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? She was not of the lineage of the other people. She was not Jewish. And yet, God chose her to be in that line. Naomi and Ruth were living on leftovers, literally. Literally. They were living on leftovers, and they were glad to get it. And, and so, leftovers, another side of that is sometimes after our children left and we cook, we still cook with the recipes that we cooked with before. And I want you to know, when we make a pot of chili, it'll feed an army. And so what Tammy will say is, I'll stick it in the fridge and we can eat on it this week. And I want to tell you, by the end of the week, I don't want chili again for a year. But, <laughs> but I'm glad to get it. And I won't complain. I'll eat it. She said, do you want chili? Now, I know when she says that, what she's saying is, I really don't want chili, but I want to make sure you don't want it either. And I said, well, and this is my response. Well, honey, I, I'm good either way, but now if you want something different, I'm okay with that. I can live with, a, I can live with something different. If you want to go and get a hamburger, if you want to go and get a chicken sandwich, if you want to go and get a salad, I can live with it. I'll be okay, I'm telling you. And what she knows is that means let's go. And so we have, a, we have an understanding with that. And now, let me, let me just go ahead and tell you what we've started doing when we know that we're going to be eating leftovers until they expire. Uh, what we do is we freeze them. We leave enough out for a day or two and freeze the rest. And then we take them out at a later time and then eat again. <laughs> and so we... We enjoy that. Too. We just have a good time with it. These ladies were between a rock and a hard place, as the old saying goes. There did not appear to be any way for them to get out of this situation. They didn't, they didn't know what they were going to do. And I want to commend Naomi. She was obviously a good mother-in-law. Now, I've heard horror stories about mother-in-laws. I have. Not all mother-in-laws are bad. One man went to a dealership and he went in and he said, I want to buy the smallest car you have. And the guy was confused. He said, okay, he carried him over there and this car had two doors and it was like really small, just a little bigger than a smart car. And he said, may I ask what, why you want a car this small? Because you're, you're not a, a short fellow. You're actually a, a pretty good sized fellow and he said well I've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and they told me I had two weeks left to live so I'm going to load my mother-in-law and wife up and we're going to strike out across country and it'll have to be the longest two weeks of my life y'all are like okay I don't know about this but laying all jokes aside mother-in-laws can be good and mother-in-laws can make a huge difference in your life. Again, I, I've heard a lot of horror stories. 
about in-laws, and, and I, didn't, I haven't found all that to be so in my personal life. And so, Naomi was a good mother-in-law. She was such a good mother-in-law that the daughter-in-laws didn't want to leave even after their husbands died. They didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay with her. And as this story unfolds, what we see is that God's plan begins to unfold. I want you to know that when you're in a bad spot in life, you will survive. You will make it through it. You will grow in appreciation. You will see the hand of God at work. But I also want you to notice this. Ruth was humble enough to go out and glean. She wasn't too good to do that. She was willing to do what was necessary. She humbled herself and realized that she was going to, if she was going to help provide, then she was going to have to go out and and glean the fields and hopefully get enough to sustain them for a period of time. And that's what she did. And so she was making preparations. People will often say things like, well, God will provide for you. Yes, he will. I want you to know that. But I also want you to know this. God provides for the sparrows too, but they don't sit on a branch with their mouth open open the beak open waiting for a worm to fall out of the sky they go out and get their food they search for it god provides it he he places it and they have to go actively seek to get it you see if naomi and ruth had went back and said oh well god's going to he's going to provide manna maybe he would have but what i do know is that sometimes god provides it you have to be willing to humble yourself to go get it And that's what Ruth was willing to do. She knew that they needed it. She really didn't suspect that it was going to fall out of the sky. So she went out and actively did her part, and it put her in a place to meet Boaz. That was a defining moment based on a decision that she made. But I want you to notice this. The second thing is a defining moment requires endurance. God is working in your life long before you ever realize it. He is at work, and uh, I I guess I I was thinking about when people cook. I I don't know if you've ever eaten a cake that was uh, had salt substituted for sugar by accident, but it's not good. It definitely tastes different. You see, all the ingredients of a cake only work when you physically put them together and do your part. You have to endure that, and you have to go through, and you have to put all of that together, and you have to realize that each ingredient is critical. Each component is critical for the outcome of that cake. Well, so is your life. You see, all the things that's happening in your life, each one of them by themselves is an ingredient that has to come together for the full recipe to produce what it was intended to produce. And when all of that happens, the finished product looks vastly different. And that means that God is at work. And the outcome is a result of defining moments in your life. We have defining moments that creates an intended outcome that God has for us. There are things that we would never, ever imagine that would happen, that have happened. I could stop right now and tell you some things that, uh, although I'm going to move on, but I could tell you some things that God has done. uh, I would never, ever have imagined, but I can look back now And see how God brought it all together and it all came together and produced something as a result of that situation. When Ruth went to glean, Boaz took notice of her. Now notice you have to endure for a season. She had to go through this hard time. They both had to go through this hard time. 
And it says that she had such virtue that it was spoken of all throughout Judah. That she was such a virtuous person. You see, she probably married at an early age. And it tells us in chapter 1 that uh, probably, I think we could glean from that, about 10 years of marriage. So she may have been, uh, may have been 25 when uh, somewhere in that age, uh, somewhere in the 20 range, uh, somewhere close, give or take, the mid-20s. And uh, Boaz took notice of this. And he, he went to her, and again he told her, he said, just glean in my field. Don't go in the other one, just stay in mine. And she did that. She did exactly what he said. And there's a lot more to the story. But to roll it up, in chapter 4, Boaz found out that Elimelech had sold their property during the famine. And he went and purchased that property back for Naomi. He bought that property back that was in their family line. That was their family property. And he bought that property back and gave it to her. And then if you read a little further, uh, you can discover in chapter 4 that Boaz married Ruth and they had descendants together. And uh, I've already mentioned that, but her effort to endure was a defining moment in her life. Maybe, maybe instead of getting to a point in life and questioning ourselves whether or not we should have done that or whether we should do something different, maybe we should look at where we are and figure out what we need to do right now. Because you see, Ruth could have said, I didn't sign up for this. I thought I was going to go back and everybody was going to take care of us. No, Ruth knew all that in the beginning. She knew that. She knew that no one was going to take care of them. They were going to have to work. She knew that because she said, if you die, I die. If you live, I live. Whatever you do, I'm in with you all the way, all the way to the end. But she didn't. She didn't say any of that. She simply endured for a season. Now, she went out in a strange place around strange people, strangers, and they took notice of her. And it seems that people coming in from the outside would not have been easily accepted. And the reason I say that is because in chapter 2 and verse 9, once again, Boaz told Ruth that none of the other women would touch her. He had already given them instructions not to touch her. So it seems to me maybe they could have got a little irritated and uh, wanted to throw her out of the field because they're taking away from what she had. You know what, today we may find ourselves doing things like that, in, even in the church. You know what we do sometimes? We say, that's my seat. Or somebody will walk up and they'll stand there and stare at you. And they look over and they look. And what they're doing is saying, get over here. That's my seat. And then I've had people go up and say, uh, we sit there. Don't do that. Let me tell you what you do. If somebody's in your seat, find another one. Right now, there's plenty. Just move. It might do you good. You might see things from a different angle. It might be really good for you. And so as they would harvest, it was a time where the less fortunate people would be able to glean as well. And that was something that they did. They gave back. They gave back. They honored God by honoring widows and the less fortunate in their day. Now, again, I do want to say that the Bible says that a man who, in 2 Corinthians, a man who won't work should not eat. And I want you to keep that in mind. Ruth wasn't holding up a sign that said, just hungry. And I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just telling you. Ruth said, I want a chance to get it for myself. Give me that chance. When I was in high school, I hate to admit this, but I really didn't care about my grades. I'm just being honest. I didn't care. I just wanted to get out. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to get out. I didn't care. But when I went to college, I was older, and I cared then. And I realized that how well I did would be directly proportionate to how well I made up my mind I was going to do. 
In other words, I had to study hard, and because of the way I did in high school, I had to study a little harder. And so all I did was make it worse on myself, but I'll tell you what, by the time I got to seminary, I had brushed the rust off. I was good to go. And so we, we have to be willing to pay the price. We have to be willing to endure for a season to reap the benefit and the blessing that God has for us. And I've discovered that a lot of people don't want to do that these days. They don't want to do that. They don't want to put forth any effort. They want it easy. They want it free. And I'm talking about church folk. I'm not talking about welfare. I'm talking about church folk. People will volunteer for something and they'll say, well, I thought it was going to be easy. Please, don't be misinformed. There's nothing in the church that's easy. Nothing. Everything requires time. It requires your effort. It requires you dedicating yourself to the task. And if you don't, well, the outcome of that will be seen. But there didn't appear to be any doubt in these two, two ladies' lives. Now, please notice this. They're in a hard time in their life. But there's not a word of expressing doubt. Not a word. If you let a seed of doubt get in your life and in your mind, it'll distort what you do for God. A seed grows into something bigger. And when you start doubting, I want you to know that you will become discouraged. The devil throws, he, he sows seeds by the wayside, and sometimes those seeds are doubt. God can't provide for you. How do you think, is this really the life you want to walk around in a field and pick up barley heads? Is this what you want to do? Is this how you want to spend the rest of your life? There's got to be something better out there for you. You need to find you a man. You need to do whatever, you, so on and so on and so on. No, no. You see, Ruth wasn't looking for a man, but she found one. Years ago, I'm going to close in a moment, but a, a lady, a church member, I paid her a visit, and she said, Preacher, I need you to do something for me. I said, Yes, ma'am, I'll do my best, but I can't make any promises until I know what it is. She said, I've got to find me a man, and I need your help. I said, I'm out of this one. I'm out of this one. It's not working for me. I said, You're on your own. And, and so I, I, I stepped back out of the picture. If you look too hard, what you may find will be trouble. But if you step back and let God bring it into your life, it'll be a blessing. Let God bring it into your life. Naomi is older. She's older. Ruth is much more capable and much, much younger. And she doesn't expect Naomi to go to the field. She said, I'll do this. I'll take care of it. Now let me... Let me say this, and I'm going to close after this. One of the hardest things for people to do is let others help them. I'm speaking from experience. Let me do that for you. I can do it myself. I don't need any help. Sometimes you need help. And sometimes we have to realize that God has sent people into our lives to bless us, and we have to step back and let them do something that God has called them to do that will bless not only us, but them as well. Don't expect people to do for you, but let people do for you when they want to do for you. If someone wants to pick up something this heavy, well, okay, you can get that. Let them. Let them get that. It's all right. Many times we fail to think about the impact of our choices. You make choices, and choices make you. And in this situation, these ladies chose to go back to Bethlehem, and they lived on leftovers, and everything changed for them. Their motive, their heart, it was all in the right place, and God honored that. So, friends, today, I don't know what it is in your life that you're facing. 
You may be at this moment between a rock and a hard place. Be humble. Glean and let God provide. Know that this process, the gleaning process, is part of God's plan to get you somewhere else. This is not permanent. The gleaning wasn't permanent. It was just for a season, literally a season. As soon as the harvest was over, the gleaning was over. And in all of this short harvest process, God provided for two ladies, created a grandmother in the line of Jesus, and provided for both of the ladies through a man who was next of kin and redeemed the land back that Abimelech had sold. God restored it all and then some. And God will do for you just what he did for them. Do it humbly. Enjoy your leftovers. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this word today. And as we share it, I pray, knowing that, Father, oftentimes when we find ourselves in spots like this, it's very difficult. It's very hard, and we don't really know what to do. And it may be today that there's someone out here that maybe they're in this position, not literally, but figuratively speaking, they're in their own situation. They're gleaning their own field. They're trying to do what they can where they are. And, Father, they're being faithful in every way they can. They're being humble, and they're doing all that they can And they can't see the outcome. They don't know what to do. But we know and trust that you have a plan and that it's all working out for their good. We have to go through the season of living on leftovers before we truly appreciate and even see what you're doing. Father, teach us, grow us, and help us to be humble and appreciative for what you do in our lives. And if there's anyone out here today that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they will do so. If there's anyone, Father, out here that simply wants to come and pray during this time of invitation, give them the strength to do so. Father, work in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, I want to invite you to Jesus. If you need to come, I'm going to invite you to come, kneel down, come sit on the front row, come pray with me. If you're looking for a church home, if you're looking for salvation, I can lead you in the right direction. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. Come to Jesus today. Come. Thank you uh, for being here today, and don't forget to, about the men's Bible study and the women's Bible study tonight at 6, and also about the bake sale out in the foyer by the women on mission. So please, uh, if you would, just step out there and help them if you uh, so feel led to, and let us pray. 
Father, as we get ready to dismiss this place, we're heading into the mission field outside of these doors. And as we head out of these doors, I pray that we will be a witness, we'll be the salt and light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember the Lord loves you. I love you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.